Hallelujah. You may be seated. You may be seated. I'm not going to fly. I'm just honored tonight, especially to be here. Honored for you coming. Definitely honored for our good friend, Nathan Urshan, Nathan P. Urshan. And I'm honored to have Joel Urshan. But I'm also honored to have our bishops from around the states. We have Bishop Brown from Louisiana, Monroe. We have Bishop Walton from Cartridge, Mississippi. We have Bishop Kearney from Texas. We have Bishop Bell from Texas, Leesville. And we have our good prayer warrior, <laughs> Bishop Cawthorn from Freeport. And we're grateful. We certainly got some other bishops that's here and pastors. We're just so grateful. These men has helped make this conference what it is. And I'm thankful for that. Now, my job and assignment is to introduce our speaker. But, you know, I, I think it would be more fitting if his father would introduce him. Amen. So I'm going to let my friend from south side of Indianapolis to introduce his son tonight. And before I sit down, I want to thank God for the IBC choir. Let's give them a hand. <laughs> Certainly want to give them a hand. And I want to thank Bishop Mooney for, I call him Bishop, Pastor Mooney, for allowing you all to come over and sing for us. We're just elated that you came tonight to be a part of this great ark celebration. It's not the end. This is only the beginning. So before I go any farther, I'm going to bring to you uh, Pastor Urshan to introduce his son to you. Come on, put your hands together. Say what you need to say. Thank you, Bishop Harris. Hasn't this been a fantastic week? We have been involved in putting together many conferences and uh, these kind of conferences are very expensive. And I appreciate the uh, response of so many people to help and underwrite uh, the financial realities of a conference like this. And uh, uh, I was so touched by the ministry of Royce Fields today and the bishops that spoke yesterday. And uh, I'm honored and humbled to be a part of wonderful people like this. You cannot find a sweeter dispositioned congregation than Victory Tabernacle anywhere. They will knock you down with love. They will trip you up with hospitality. And uh, where, where's, uh, where's my good friend? Elder Ogden Williams. Is he still here? He was the EMC tonight. And um, Ogden Williams is a, is a very good friend of a, a man by the name of Mr. Mike Pence. You ever heard of Mr. Mike Pence? And uh, I felt all along that Brother Williams, who was the deputy mayor, Indianapolis should have been mayor. Can you imagine at a city council meeting, Ogden Williams shouting and running the aisles? And I thank God for men of, of this caliber that love this truth. And of course, our bishop and first lady, uh, who we so admire. Um, but I, I, I would like to just, just take a quick moment to give you a little background of your speaker tonight. And um, 
We're so glad to have my sister with us tonight, Evangelist Annette Elms. She's preaching for us tomorrow. And uh, tremendous, been tremendously used of God. She's from Amarillo, Texas. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> uh, your speaker uh, tonight was uh, raised along with his brother and, and his sister who is here tonight. Uh, we, we took a home mission church in Memphis, Tennessee that was nine blocks from Graceland. And um, uh, they were raised there and uh, then we moved to Indiana. We came to Indiana and... Um, uh, we had ran into the beast of Ephesus, some criminal elements in the church. Uh, many pastors have had difficult people to deal with, but I'd put these people up against anybody. They were character assassins. They were destructive agents that tried to destroy us. And part of it was because they hated the truth of the new birth message, and they retaliated against us. And against my father. So we left there and we came back to Indiana where I thought we were coming home. But instead we came to some of our apostolic brethren that didn't want us here. And uh, there's still some here that don't want us here. I'm just being very transparent tonight. So with all of that going on and people trying to destroy you and people talking against you at every turn. You come home thinking you find some encouragement, strength, and finding just the opposite. Um, I decided to give up the ministry. I, it was too much. These, these enemies were too great to me. And you will find that echoed in the Psalms by the Psalmist David. And so I decided to give up the ministry. I couldn't support my family. They had made sure we were financially destitute and and uh, I, I didn't know what I was going to do. I would started mowing grass and painting uh, little buildings and decks and, you know, just trying to scrap out a living. And uh, I walked out into the sunlight one day, and uh, I was getting ready to make the decisions to try to figure out what to do with my family. I couldn't support them. We had no place to live. So I walked out, and the the Lord of heaven spoke to me out of the sunshine, just right by the sunshine that day. And he said, you're not going anywhere. He said, your future will be bigger, brighter, and greater than ever before. And he said, I am going to also mightily anoint your children. Now, now that's easy to think about when things are going good. But when you, when you are up against it and there's no hope, you feel like your children are in great jeopardy because you can't help them. And so I, 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 they, they, the, the boys just happened to be out that day, and they were playing in a sandbox with the neighborhood kids. I looked over, and they, they had their little trucks and G.I. Joes. and this, They just having the biggest time. They were having the greatest time of their life. Just little, little skinny kids. And I looked over and I said, God, you anoint those little skinny kids? And the, the Lord said, don't minimize. I can do anything. I will raise up your children someday. So I stand here tonight to present to you your speaker um, who has ministered around the world. Uh, his sister is here tonight with her husband who is the greatest general contractor in Indiana, and um, uh, blessed of the Lord, uh, their brother, we're going next week to Memphis, Tennessee to help install him into a church, and we have heard there's somewhere in the neighborhood of 2,000 people going to show up for that installation. Uh, Nathaniel A. Urshan will be installed. Uh, after we spent almost 10 years in Memphis, he's going to be installed as the pastor in Memphis, and that's just going to keep on going on. And he's an amazing preacher by the help of God and the anointing of God. And I I'm not going to tell you that your preacher tonight is amazing. You just tell me what you think. 
what he gets done because God has used him in the most amazing, amazing way. When we named him, we named him Joel, which is the condensed versions of the name of God and the word for God. Joe is a condensed version of Jehovah and El is a part of Elohim. Joel, hallelujah. And uh, I present him to you tonight to preach to you at this art conference. Thank you, Bishop Harris, for allowing us. We don't deserve to be a part of anything, but by the blessing and the mercy and the kindness of God, he has enabled us to be a part of something like this. And uh, I'd like for your uh, last night conference speaker to come, preach to you, open his heart. And uh, I'd like for you to just receive the word of the Lord as we have the last two days in such an amazing fashion from so many wonderful people. Amen. Amen. Brother Pastor Joel Urshan, Cincinnati, Ohio. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, very much. Could we give God praise tonight? Could we give God praise? All across this building, let's magnify the Lord. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Come on, if he's been good to you, lift up a high praise unto the Lord. If he's been better to you than you've been to yourself, if he's picked you up, turned you around, placed your feet on solid ground, you've got a reason and a right to praise the Lord. Come on, let's magnify his name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What a great privilege it is to be here tonight. And I thank my father for those very kind words. And I thank my father and my mother for the way they raised us in the truth of God's word. Amen. And they sacrificed so that we could, so that we could experience the great blessings of the Lord in our life. I'm so eternally grateful for that. To be here tonight is such a privilege. God bless you, Bishop Harris. Thank you, sir. And First Lady Harris, God bless you. Can we give them a great big hand of gratitude and appreciation? Amen. And to, to all of the bishops that are here tonight, and the pastors, the ministers, God bless you. Each and every one of you that are on the platform, those that are in the uh, congregation, all of the saints of God that have gathered, thank you for being here tonight. I feel the presence of the Lord here in a powerful way. God is great and greatly to be praised. Indiana Bible College Choir, Dr. Anderson, what a great, wonderful, wonderful uh, move of the Lord we felt. We thank you. And uh, I appreciate so much this wonderful group of young people who love God, have committed their lives to his calling. And uh, I can sense the presence of the Lord upon this whole meeting. And I concur with my father about Victory Tabernacle. Amen. What a wonderful congregation of the Lord in this great city. And we thank you so much for the kind hospitality and allowing us to come. Uh, I'm here with my daughter, Sophia Urshan. Uh, my youngest daughter, and uh, we were driven by a wonderful uh, young man from our church, Brother Aaron Williams. Amen. And we got two Brother Aaron Williams here tonight. And they're friends with one another. Amen. And we thank the Lord for that. It's good to be in the family of the Lord. And uh, it's, it's wonderful to be able to worship God together. And I uh, am very humbled to be able to stand before you. I don't uh, feel worthy to be able to ever handle this book that I'm about to handle. But I believe the Lord has given me something to preach tonight. And by his help and his anointing, I'm going to endeavor to do so. From the book of Exodus, the seventh chapter. The book of Exodus, the seventh chapter, the eighth verse. Exodus chapter seven and verse number eight. And we're going to read a few verses of scripture in your hearing tonight. From the word of the Lord, Exodus chapter seven. Beginning with verse 8, what a wonderful honor it is to be teamed with all of the great speakers that have spoken throughout the day today. And last night, Pastor Sam Emery, a dear friend, I know, I'm surprised there's a platform still up here. 
I fully expected things just to be shredded by the time Pastor Emery got done. What a preacher. Exodus chapter 7 and verse 8, the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, When Pharaoh shall speak unto you, saying, Show a miracle for you, then thou shalt say unto Aaron, Take thy rod, cast it before Pharaoh, and it shall become a serpent. And Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh, and they did so as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers, now the magicians of Egypt. They also did in like manner with their enchantments. For they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. But, but Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. And I would like to preach for just a few moments this evening in the spirit of this conference on this subject, the superior serpent. The superior serpent. Could we just lift up our voices one more time unto the Lord and give him praise for what he has done and ask his anointing and his favor upon the remainder of this service. Oh God, we praise you and thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for your presence in this house for we feel you are here to heal, that you are here to save, that you are here to restore and deliver. I pray in the mighty name, the matchless name of Jesus, that you would anoint your messenger and anoint this congregation as we declare your word and hear your word. Lord, let it resonate. Let the seed find good ground that it may grow up before you as a mighty tree, bearing the peaceable fruit of righteousness. We thank you for it today and give you praise in the precious name of, the of Lord. Jesus. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. It was the emblem of suffering and shame. How I love that old cross. Where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. Years I spent in vanity and pride. Caring not my Lord was crucified. Knowing not it was for me he died at Calvary. Mercy there was great. And grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Sometimes when we sing those beautiful songs of old and we maybe sway to it, clap to it, even just hum it, we, we sometimes lose in the, perhaps the melody, the seriousness of that moment. Sometimes we don't fully fathom all that happened at Calvary. I think it is worth us spending every morning for the rest of our lives waking up and revisiting that place, that scene, the scene of that awful crime against our Christ and recognizing in different ways the multi-angular way that God defeated death on our behalf. Read Isaiah 53 again. Read Matthew, the last few chapters, and Mark, the last few chapters, and Luke, the last few chapters, and John, the last few chapters. Read what the apostles said of it. Read what the apostles, the prophets, spoke of it in, in, in time before it even developed. They saw it afar off and spoke of its day that would come. Read about it. Think about it. Pray about it. Ponder it over and over and over again until it roots itself in your soul. Because if we ever want to have an apostolic restoration, then we are going to have to be deeply acquainted with Calvary. 
deeply acquainted with the cross. When Paul arrived in Corinth and found that church going haywire, people uprooting themselves from scriptural principles, people backsliding, the gifts of the Spirit were out of order, people didn't know the difference between man and woman, people were going in all different directions. They were committing strange forms of fornication. And Paul didn't even know where to start, but he did know where to start. He said, I knew nothing among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. If we're going to bring this thing back into order, then it's going to start with Jesus Christ and him crucified. Before you can talk about Jesus Christ and him glorified, then you've got to understand Jesus Christ and him crucified. Before you can understand Jesus Christ and Him coming again, then you've got to understand Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I know you think you do understand it. I know, I know you, you're already bored with what I'm saying because you've heard it all before. You've sung about it. You've talked about it. You've thought about it. And you think you know all about it. But I want you to know that we could never understand the magnitude, the depth of the love of God. We'll spend the rest of our days trying to know what is the height and what is the breadth and what is the depth and what is the length of the love of God. Trying to comprehend with all saints what is, what, what, what manner of love is this that the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Hallelujah. Oh, I know, I know. You, you can quote the rest of the old rugged cross. I know you can quote the rest of at Calvary. You could quote the rest of them. And I and then you know all about it. But but do you and do I? Do we know all about it? We need to stand. At the foot of that blood-stained emblem of suffering and shame. And fully understand what our God did for us. Because this was the moment that changed everything. It was the moment that fulfilled law. It was the moment that rent the veil in the temple in twain. Hallelujah from top to bottom. It was the moment Ladies and gentlemen, where, where all principalities and all powers were subdued. I, I know that it's easy to just flippantly say, Jesus died for me. And we don't even really know what it is that we're saying when we say that. It's so easy to just say, Jesus Christ died for sinners. And yet there is so much wrapped up in that one saying. See, we've got to understand that Jesus Christ was our sacrifice. You know, it was supposed to be you on that cross. You do know that, correct? I mean, you do realize it was supposed to be you and I with, with nail prints in our hands. It was supposed to be you and I with a spear wound deep within our side. It was supposed to be you and I with nail prints in our feet. It was supposed to be you and I with a crown of thorns shoved onto our head. It's supposed to be you and I with stripes on our back. But God, who is rich in mercy <laughs> hallelujah I, I don't know if I'm going to as much preach as I am praise tonight because he's worthy of the praise there is a reason why we praise him and it's not because we're emotional it's not because we just anything can trigger us and we'll clap and we'll dance and we'll shout no 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 we think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me that's when my soul cries out hallelujah thank God thank God thank God for saving me. He became my substitute. He became my substitute. 
That's why he told them on that great day of Mount Moriah, he said, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. Before Abraham was, I am. The day of Christ that Abraham saw was when that ram wrestling in the thicket took the place of Isaac strapped to an altar. That was the day of Christ. Because what that ram did for Isaac, Jesus did for you and Jesus did for me. Hallelujah. Not only was he our sacrifice, not only was he our substitute, but Jesus Christ, listen, listen, he became our sin. Have you ever wondered why there was such a brutal crucifixion? Because he became the very sin that we had committed. I mean, why didn't he just get a lethal injection and die for our sin? Why didn't, why wasn't it something, some kind of a mercy killing? And he could die for our sins. But no, no. He was wounded. Not for his transgressions, but, but for our transgressions. And he was bruised, not for his iniquities, but for our iniquities. And it was the chastisement of our peace, not his peace, our peace that was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. The brutality of his crucifixion occurred because he who knew no sin became sin was made sin for us that's why the bible says it pleased the father to bruise him it pleased the father to bruise him because this one oh help me holy ghost me let me just preach the gospel of jesus christ to you god was manifest in the flesh god was justified in the spirit. God was seen of angels. God was believed on in the world. God was received up into glory. Hallelujah. Preached unto the Gentiles. It was God who sent forth his son. He himself became the only begotten son of God. God sent forth his son. Made of a woman. Made under the law. The father in human flesh. And he lived a life that you and I are required to live. But incapable of living. He lived a life above reproach he lived a life above the fray of falling to temptation there was no fornication in him there was no envy in him there was no hatred in him there was no racism in him there was no lust of the flesh lust of the eyes the pride of life there was no sin there was no transgression even though he was tempted in all points as we are tempted Tempted, he was without sin. Don't you realize that's the reason that he rose from the dead? The only reason death has any authority over any of us is because of the sin in, our, in the members of our body. It is the sin in us that gives death jurisdiction over us. And so we die and move into the assembly line of death. And death just moves us on down the assembly line. Death, hell, and the grave. Death, hell, and the grave. Death, hell, and the grave. But when Jesus' body came down into that assembly line, they looked all over that body to find where the iniquity was, but there was no iniquity. They looked for the transgression, but there was no transgression. They looked for sins of presumptuousness, but there were no sins of presumptuousness. Death had no jurisdiction over his body. That's how Jesus rose from the grave. His obedience in life 
was just as important as his death on the cross. I'll go even further and say his obedience in life was better than his death on the cross. Because without his obedience in life, he would have been just another martyr who died for a great cause. And Samuel agrees with me. He looked at Saul and said, don't you know to obey is better than sacrifice. It was a messianic prophecy. He was letting Saul know that the obedience will be better than the sacrifice itself. My Savior lived his whole life above temptation for me. He lived his whole life clean, innocent, pure, and holy, and righteous. Because he knew I couldn't do it by myself. So he did it for me. I'm telling you, what a wonderful Savior. What, what, a, what, a, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. He lived a life of purity and it was real purity. It wasn't fake purity. It was real righteousness. It wasn't self-righteousness. It wasn't a stench to his society. Sinners loved him. They ran to him. They did not run from him. They ran to him. I'm going to just tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. We need a revival of real holiness. And I, I, I'm telling you, we, listen, when son, sinners are running from us, we're not like Jesus. Say that again. And they ran to him not because they felt comfortable in their sin. They wanted liberty from their sin. They ran to him because they realized he had the answer. Don't tell me they didn't run to him. There were legions of devils in that man. But he got up and, and with legions of devils holding on to his ankles and holding on to his arms. He ran to Jesus and he worshipped him. Oh, I'm telling you, he's a sweet savior. Ah. Oh, sweet wonder. Oh, sweet wonder. Jesus, the son of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He became our sin. He who, who knew no sin. And because he knew no sin, he was qualified to be made sin. He was like that spotless lamb. He was like that scapegoat. He, he who knew no sin. The Lord laid on him. The iniquity of all of us. There's not a soul in this place who should withhold your worship from the great I am. Who was and is and is to come. The almighty God. <laughs> that day at Calvary when Jesus was brutally pierced and murdered, martyred, wounded, bruised. It was the fulfillment of an ancient prophecy. The very first curse that was ever issued on the earth was issued to the serpent. Sin had just been committed. Transgression of the law of God had just been enacted. 
And God came down into the garden as at other times. Man was hiding. Finally, he spoke up and said, the woman made me do it. And God looked at the woman and the woman said, the serpent made me do it. Everybody deflecting, pushing it on over to the serpent. And God looked at the serpent and said, they're right. You are the culprit. On your belly shall you go. Now notice what he said. He said, you're going to eat the dust. The dust shall you eat. Now, now let me remind you what we're made out of. For the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. You want to know what this flesh is? This flesh is dust. You know what the serpent feeds on? Dust. You want to know what the serpent feeds on? Flesh. This is why preachers need to stand in their pulpits and preach. Crucify the flesh. Crucify the flesh. Crucify the flesh. Because the devil feeds on it. The serpent eats it up. He feeds on it. Oh, you don't believe me? You notice in Genesis chapter 3, he's a slithering little serpent in the Garden of Eden. By the time you get to the book of Revelation, he's a fire-breathing dragon with wings. How did he get so big? He's been feeding off of our fleshly ways. God said, you will bruise the heel of the seed of the woman, but he shall crush your head. God served notice to the serpent. You're going down. You are going down. Well, how are you going to do it? Don't worry about that. You just know it's going to happen. You just know I will put you under my feet. Oh, I need somebody to hear me because you know what? You've been flirting with the devil too long. I'm preaching to somebody. You've been hanging around the devil too long. And the Lord wants you to know to put him under your feet. Put him under your feet. Put him under your feet. Ah, thank you, Jesus. Glory. So Moses and Aaron are standing in Pharaoh's court. And while he's stand, standing in Pharaoh's court, and they've never been here before, they're not sure what's about to happen. They're just going by faith in God. And God said to Moses, when Pharaoh asks you for a miracle, you give him the first miracle I ever showed you. I want you to tell Aaron to take his rod and cast it down to the earth. When that rod reaches the earth, it will turn into a serpent. Just do it. So Aaron throws down his rod and it turns into a serpent. And Pharaoh looks at it, looks over his mag magicians and says, should we do that? Can we do that? You guys got something? They're like, we got this. <laughs> and with their enchantments, they seemed to duplicate what Moses and Aaron had just done. With their enchantments, with their sorcery, with their witchcraft, they conjured up in some way. I don't ask me how they did it, but I know they threw down their rods. They threw down their rods and their rods turned into serpents. All of them, the Bible said. But. Aaron's serpent swallowed up the serpents of the magicians. They lost their rods that day. They walked into that business meeting with staffs in their hand and they lost them. Now you got to understand the way God dealt with Moses because, because God was in a perpetual state, a constant state of revealing himself to Moses. See, he was continually showing Moses what we just talked about. 
the life of Christ and the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Moses was seeing it unfold in different ways throughout his life. Hebrews chapter 11 says it this way. Moses endured as seeing him who is invisible. All of this is invisible. None of this he can even see. It hasn't happened yet. But God was showing him time after time. With each miracle, God was showing him the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He did it with every miracle. I, just, just to name a few. He said, Moses, I want you to take that rod and I want you to put it in the water. And I want you to turn the water into blood. Now, that's an interesting miracle to me because whose blood was that? He didn't say turn it into red stuff. He said turn it into blood. The waterways of Egypt were turned into blood. I don't know whose blood that was, but if I had to guess, I'd say it was the blood of the lamb. Now, the reason I'd say that is simply because... What that blood did to every living thing in that water is what the blood of the lamb did to every spiritually parasitic virus and bacteria in my soul. Everything died as soon as the blood touched it. See, that's what happened to me when I stepped into the waters of baptism. The water was chilly and the water was cold. But when I got down into the water, they said, upon the confession of your faith, in the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and because you've repented of your sins, I now baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And when they put me down in the water, the water turned to blood. And every devilish thing that used to be alive died. Every hellish thing that used to be alive died. Every ungodly desire, every ungodly deed, every ungodly way died. In the blood of the Lamb. Just Moses, I just want you to know how it works. This is how it works. They walk up to the Red Sea. They're out of Egypt. They come up to the Red Sea. And it looks like Moses doesn't have a plan. The plan is just believe and trust God. That's the plan. You're you sure we're supposed to be here? Yep, this is where the map leads us. Well, GPS will do that to you sometime. It's what happened. We're here. We should be back in Egypt. We should go eat all the melons and and, and garlic and onion and, yeah. and cucumbers and in Egypt, stand still, stand still. I want you to hear what he said. He said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Now, what kind of restoration conference am I in? Yeah. Apostolic restoration conference. Apostolic people know what salvation of the Lord in Hebrew translates to in English. When he said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord in Hebrew, he was saying, stand still and see Yahshua. And when Moses lifted up that rod and the Red Sea parted, God was saying, Moses, take a look at Jesus. telling you when you're looking at the Red Sea you're looking at Jesus they walked through on dry ground came up on the other side and what did their enemies do they stepped into the water I think it's interesting that it was a red sea because it was a crimson stream that washed my enemies away I just want you to know how it works, Moses. This is how I'm going to do it. The horse and the rider hath he cast into the sea. 
What sea? The Red Sea. What sea? The Crimson Sea. Oh, hallelujah. I just want you to know how it works, Moses. And they come up on the other side. Every one of their enemies were left in those waters. Just like every one of my sins were left in those waters. They came up on the other side rejoicing. They came to a place called Mara. When they get to Mara, they can't even drink the waters. They're poisonous. They're bitter. They can't drink them. And the Lord said, Moses, let me tell you how this is going to work. One day they'll all put it all together. But you see that tree? Go take that tree and put it into the water. Why, Lord? Just do it. Now we know why. Jesus said, I am the vine. You are the branches. Just stick the vine into the water. And the waters will be healed. And they go from Mara and they go to a place called Rephidim. When they go to a place called Rephidim, they need water. They need something to drink. And they started complaining. And Moses said, Lord, what shall I do? He said, I'm going to tell you how this works. You see that rock? I want you to smite. Oh, Shandala Mohai. Smite that rock. Now we, now Moses, Moses is enduring as seeing him who is invisible. He's just going along with what the Lord is telling him to do. He's going to smite the rock because the Lord told him to smite the rock. But Paul let us know what was really going on. He said that rock followed them and that rock was Christ. See, that rock followed them. It was with them every step. That means it was the same rock. That same rock when Moses said, show me thy glory. And the Lord said, it's too much for you. He said, no, no, I need you to show me thy glory. And the Lord said, well, there is a place, but it's in the rock. Who's that rock? That rock is Christ. So if you want to see my glory, there's only one way to see my glory. you got to be hidden in the rock. Or let me make it more plain. You've got to be buried in Christ. God did this constantly throughout the scriptures. It, it, that's, that's what he was doing. When Gideon was shattering the pitcher, the light was inside the pitcher. It's found in John 1, 6. In him was life. Verse 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. When that body was pierced at Calvary, the light came forth. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus even did it in his miracles. He did it in his miracles. I always wondered, why did Jesus spit into the ground? That was a kind of a crazy miracle, wasn't it? Jesus spits into the ground. And then he makes clay of the spittle, puts it into the blind man's eyes. And, and the Lord, I said, Lord, why'd you make, why'd you spit into the ground and make clay of the spittle? And he began to show me. It was a revelation. It was the incarnation. As that spit descended to the earth and hit the ground. And he picked that spit and mixed it with the dust. See, I need to preach to somebody right now. The Holy Ghost overshadowed Mary. You hear what I'm telling you? When deity came down and mixed with the dust, he picked it up and made clay of the spittle and put the revelation of the mighty God in Christ in the man's blind eyes and said, go baptize your eyes in the pool of Siloam. Yeah. Yeah. And when he did, he could see. He said, if you want to see water turn to wine, go get me some, go get me some water pots of stone. I need some, I need some earthly vessels and I need you to pour the water into the vessel because that's how I make changes. That's how I restore. That's how I reconcile. God in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. All things are become new. So Moses, I want, you to, I want you to come close. I want you to come close, Moses. Take off your shoes. The place where on you stand is holy ground. And, and I want you to come close. I want you to go tell Pharaoh to let my people go. 
I want to give you a miracle, Moses. I want to give you a miracle that will stay with you for the rest of your life and stay with you with all of your ministry to Pharaoh. You see that rod in your hand? Cast it down to the earth. And Moses takes that rod and casts that rod down to the earth. Now that rod, while it's in his hand, it represents power. It represents authority. It rep- you know, that rod, ladies and gentlemen, all you had to do was stretch that rod out over waters and Red Seas part. Put the rod inside of waters and waters turned to blood. That was a powerful rod. The rod represents the authority of God. That's what David meant when he said, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. But he said, I want you to take this rod and I want you to cast it down to the earth. Ladies and gentlemen, as that rod is descending to the ground, God is showing Moses the miracle of the incarnation. And that rod descending just as God was manifest in the flesh. Just as God was was taking upon himself the form of a servant. Just as God descended, 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 kept descending until he reached the very base element of the earth, the dust of the ground. And when the rod touched the dust of the ground, the rod turned into the most despicable thing. It was so despicable, so disgusting. So, so, so hard to even look upon that Moses fled from it. But God said, don't be afraid of it. Pick it up by the tail. And when he picked it up by the tail, it turned back into a rod. And with that, he was showing what will happen when that rod ascends from the earth. I... I don't even believe I'm capable of preaching what I'm trying to preach. But I'm going to tell you in the Holy Ghost what I'm trying to tell you. God's message of redemption has always been and will always be he himself descending into the form of a man taking upon the form of a servant and knowing no sin and he who knew no sin became the most vile of sins so that we could be saved I, I, I'm sorry, it takes me a little while to even fathom it because my Jesus, who is so holy, my Jesus, who is so pure, my Jesus, who is so wonderful, who is so righteous, who is above all, excellent is his name, but he himself went so low into the depths of humanity that he became like a serpent. Oh, you don't, you don't, you don't believe me. Well, let's look at the word of the Lord. Even as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. Let me remind you of what happened on that day. There were serpents coming from every which direction and they were full of venom and they were sinking their fangs into the into the 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 skin of the people of God and the venom was rushing into the bloodstream of those people rushing to the central nervous system paralyzing the activity of the heart paralyzing the lungs paralyzing the synapses of the brain they were dying every one of them and their only heart Hope was for a superior serpent to be lifted up. Our world is filled with people who are being ravaged by venomous vipers who have come from every which direction. They've come from Hollywood. They've come from hell. They've come from the world of politics. They've come from the world of business. And God forbid they've even come from inside the church. 
But venomous vipers are rushing and they're sinking their fangs in the you see it cold carnal Christians hard hearted sinners atheist agnostic people who want nothing to do with God profane vile fornicators liars greedy you hear what I'm preaching to you and I'm not just talking about the world hello somebody but they're dying they're only only hope is for us to keep lifting this message higher lift it higher lift it higher he died for my sins he became sin on my behalf lift it higher the blood still works the blood still works the blood still works keep lifting it higher Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Moses, this is the first miracle I want to show you. And I want you to, I want you to keep it with you forever. Because you're going to need it when you walk into Pharaoh's court. When you walk into Pharaoh's court, he's going to demand a miracle of you. Jesus told his disciples, they said, what sign can we give to people? He said, a wicked and an adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. No sign shall be given to it other than that of the prophet Jonah who was in the belly of a whale three days and three nights. And so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. You know what sign we're going to give them? We're going to give them the sign of Jesus lived. Hallelujah. And Jesus died. Hallelujah. And Jesus rose from the dead. If you want to know what sign your generation needs, they need Jesus lived. A perfect life. A clean life. A holy life. He died the death of a sinner. He tasted death for every man. He was numbered with the transgressors. And he went down into death, hell, and the grave and as an innocent lamb of God he who knew no sin was made to be sin for us and he rose triumphant over the grave that's all they need to know Moses Pharaoh wants a miracle that's all you're going to give him just show him the gospel take that rod and cast it down to the earth and it descends and it descends. See, a lot of people don't want to preach the one God message. Because they're afraid of being called a heretic. Preach it anyway. A lot of people don't want to preach Jesus' name, baptism, because they're afraid of being labeled Jesus only. Preach it anyway. A lot of people are afraid to preach Holy Ghost talking in tongues because they're afraid of folks saying they're a fanatic. Preach it anyway. People afraid of preaching holiness and righteous living because they're afraid of being called cultish. Preach it anyway. Let, the, let, let it descend down into the depths of humanity. Hallelujah. Aaron, take that rod. But I need this rod. Don't worry. One day that rod will bud. One day that rod will blossom. But this is the season of sacrifice. Throw the rod down and let it become. Oh my God. Preach Calvary, preach Jesus, preach the blood, preach the word, preach the name, preach the Holy Ghost. Cry loud and spare not. Go tell it on the mountain. Hallelujah. Preach it. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Preach it. Throw the rod down. Demonstrate that he's holy. Demonstrate that he's worthy. Demonstrate that the gospel is real. It fell to the earth and it turned into that vile, disgusting, cursed, cursed serpent. You say, when was Jesus cursed? When do you think he was cursed? Cursed be every man that hangeth on a tree. And Aaron is standing there. The staff hits the ground 
And immediately it changes life for him. That's what my God did for me. He came from heaven above. Fell down to this earth. Stepped into my world. Took upon my form. And became cursed. So that I wouldn't have to be. And if anybody tells you any different, let him be a curse. If anybody preaches another gospel, let him be a curse. Preach it. Preach it. Preach it in all of its honesty. Preach it in all of its transparency. Preach it in all of its ugliness. Preach it in all of its rawness. In front of Pharaoh. In front of the magicians of this world. Preach it. Live it. Don't backslide from it. Don't be ashamed of it. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. If we want an apostolic restoration, it's going to start with losing our shame of how he saved us. easy for us to criticize the Jews. They wanted him riding in on a stallion, we say. They wanted a great king, a great potentate. So do we. But he came in on a donkey. He was humble. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. There was no form nor comeliness that we should desire him. He was stricken, smitten of God, no less, and afflicted. Preach it in all of its raw honesty. Let it slither around in its truth and transparency. And when your generation conjures up some kind of false equivalent. And it's going to look like yours. It's going to sound like yours. They're going to use some of the same words you use. But Jesus warned us. Many shall come. In my name. Saying, I am Christ. Oh, I'm, let me preach to some young people right now. You're living in a generation where many are coming. Saying, I am Christ. And I am Christ. And I am Christ. And I'm okay. You're okay. And it's good. You believe what you want to believe. And I believe what I want to believe. And we'll all believe what we want to believe. And everything will be fine. We'll all be one happy family. But that's not the family of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I had somebody tell me. Listen. I had somebody tell me. They said Jesus Christ was a great teacher. I said, how great of a teacher? They said, a really great teacher. I said, what do you think about that lesson where he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. What do you think of that lesson? From the great teacher. He's more than a great teacher. Who do men say that I am? Some say you're Jeremiah. Some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah or one of the prophets. But who do you say that I am? Thou art the Christ. The son of the living God. I know it would get me hung upside down one day. But that's who you are. I know it'll get my comrades, my, my peers boiled in oil, decapitated, crucified. But, but that's who you are. Oh, in the name of Jesus. Those magicians threw down their rods. And their rods sounded apostolic. And their rods claimed to be apostolic. And their rods claimed to be Christian. And their rods acted sometimes better than other Christians. It was very confusing. But Aaron, it's not time to pick your rod up. 
Just let it go. Let the gospel be the gospel. Let the truth be the truth. Let holiness be holiness. Let Jesus' name be Jesus' name. Let the word be the word. Come on, let God do what God does. Put the word out there. Sow the seed and let him do what he does. And if you'll watch long enough. Don't scamper off afraid that your miracle failed, that your revelation was insufficient. Keep watching. Keep watching. And you're going to see which serpent is superior. And I'm going to tell you what the superior, superior serpent is. The superior serpent is to wit God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself hallelujah and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation hallelujah hallelujah you want to hear what the superior serpent is the superior serpent is for unto us a child is born and unto us a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called wonderful counselor the mighty God the everlasting father and the prince of peace here's the superior serpent in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God the same was in the beginning with God all things were made by him without him was not anything made that was made in him was life and the life was the light of men and the light shine in the darkness and the darkness comprehended it not there was a man sent from God whose name was John he was not that light but he was sin to bear witness of that light that was the true light uh, that lighteth every man that cometh into the world he came unto the world and the world knew him not uh, he came unto his own and his own received him not uh, but to as many as received him uh, to them gave he power to become the sons of God and the word was made flat and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glory is of the only begotten of the father full of grace and full of truth for in Jesus dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily and we are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power this is the superior message this is the superior gospel it will overtake prosperity preaching every day of the week it will overtake liberal ideologies every day of the week it'll overtake political philosophies that are anti-god and anti-christ every day of the week you live this life preach this word obey this gospel live this gospel teach it to your children when you're sitting in your house when you're going to bed at night before you go to bed when you wake up put it on the doorposts of your home. Hear, O Israel. Hear, O Israel. Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God is one Lord. Somebody lift your hands and give him praise right now. Somebody lift your voice under God. Hallelujah. Come on, stand with me right now. The Holy Ghost is in this place. The Holy Ghost is in this place. The Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is in this place. He called Mahaya. Every heart that is wavering from the truth be solidified in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Be solidified in the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, Father of all, who is above all, through all, in you all. Thou believest there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Hallelujah. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off even as many as the Lord our God shall call come out from among them come out from among them come out from among them and be ye separate say it the Lord What is that in thine hand? A rod. I want you to hold on to that rod because you're going to need it for every battle you face. Not only are you going to cast it down, sometimes you're going to lift it up. I want everybody to lift up your rod right now. Lift it up. Lift up your hands. I want you to lift up the name of Jesus. I want you to lift up the blood of Jesus. I want you to lift up holiness unto the Lord. I want you to lift up prayer and fasting. I want you to lift up worship. I want you to lift up the great commission. Come on, lift it up, lift it up. Lift up the unity of the brethren. The unity of the spirit. Come on, lift it up. I want you to lift up the fruit of the spirit. Lift up the gifts of the spirit. And I want you to hold that rod in place, Moses. Because there's a battle going on. And if you let the rod down, you're going to lose the battle. You've got to keep living. Too many are letting down. Too many are letting go. Too many are letting it falter. Lift it up for the world to see. Woo, come on. He is high and lifted up. And his train fills the temple. Now we're going to praise God. I want somebody right now. You don't even need the beat of the drum. I want you to praise him for the blood right now. Praise him for the blood. Go ahead. Go ahead. Come on, let some dancing get in your feet. Come on, I want somebody to get out in the aisle. Because his blood made the difference. Go ahead, go ahead, praise him, praise him, praise him because of blood. I want somebody to give him a he brought me out kind of praise. Come on, somebody. Give him a, he brought me out of the miry clay kind of prayer. Somebody needs to give him a, he set my feet on a rock to stay kind of prayer.
come on, I need some young people to come down dancing. I need some young people to come down dancing. I need some elders to come down dancing. Thank <laughs> you.